So we're all gonna die one day, huh? I'm going to die. That's kind of a downer. It's almost like you should be more productive with your time instead of spending it watching YouTube videos, right? Well, this is the only channel you're allowed to watch, so it's fine. Just tell the Grim Reaper you're watching a KP video and he'll be like, cool, what, I know people. Regardless, most people don't want to think about mortality, or their own mortality specifically. It's scary not being conscious, and then we get into all the discussions about the afterlife, and then we're gonna have to talk about religion, and then we're going to have to talk about how religion is a coping mechanism for all this, and there's a lot to unpack here. Since most adults have a hard time coming to terms with this part of their humanity, sometimes their natural urge is to shield their children from it, which causes more harm than good in my opinion. These kind of sheltering fears can also have some emotional maturity consequences in the kids themselves, which isn't healthy. Go to therapy! Animation in general seems to suffer from really real depictions of death, excluding anime, because children in the United States are usually the prime example for consuming it. These same political problems also come into play when depicting LGBTQ plus themes, and even harder, like divorce. Yeah, but there's lots of kids whose parents are divorced like mine. But in order for fiction to accurately portray relatable characters with realistic societies, it's important to include these kind of topics in our storytelling to both make these characters relatable, but also add a normalizer to many of these issues. Yes, death happens. Yes, people are gay. Yes, people get divorced. Additionally, normalizing potentially polarizing elements to your fiction can give coping tools for people suffering from these kind of environments and lead to some psychological help through character examples. Having animation shows that demonstrate healthy changes in what we, as a society, feel comfortable in depicting is nothing new. Fred and Wilma Flintstone, for instance, were the first TV couple to share a bed. This is not limited to animation, though. We have examples like how I Love Lucy was the first show to depict a female character pregnant. In a more recent example, sitcom hit Modern Family has done a lot to normalize gay relationships and parenting for those who might be foreign to the idea. Animation is a trailblazer, but also sometimes the last medium to be on the receiving end for these social inclusions because of a child audience. But death as a depiction has always been there, in some regards. Thanks to the cultural presence of Halloween, some things like skeletons and more obscure depictions of death have been around in animation pretty much since the Silver Age. Warner Brothers provided us with some more slapstick death, but Disney, as usual, was the first trailblazer for death played as for drama and animation, with some exceptions. By the mid-60s, many places that were dominated by the children demographic were already starting to show honest depictions of death in the wake of factors like the Robert Kennedy assassination. What does assassination mean? It means... Somebody getting killed in a, a sort of surprise way. And you know, the Vietnam War. I wanna go home. Disney is big on implied death. The most notable examples of when parents, usually mother characters, are missing. To add to the complex trauma of our main character learning how to cope with new challenges on their own. Harry Potter is pretty guilty of that. Mom? We're starting to get backtracks on this idea, though, as the live-action Disney films were giving us some more backstory on the missing mothers, which I guess is fine... shrug? Walt Disney himself had a huge fear of death, losing his mother in a freak carbon monoxide accident, as well as seeing death as a personal turn to all his accomplishments during his life. Even still, he's obsessed with the concept of death in the afterlife. Disneyland's The Haunted Mansion combines both of these ideas without addressing individual death, but more focused on a creepy Halloween-like aspect of the American ideals of death. You've seen this many times, but we haven't got the ghosts in there yet. But we're out collecting the ghosts. We're going to bring ghosts from all over the world. And we're making it very attractive to them, hoping, you know, they'll want to come and stay at Disneyland. So we're putting in wall-to-wall -wall cobwebs, and we guarantee them creaking doors and creaking floors. And died right across the street from Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California at St. Joseph's Hospital. Although Disney has some pretty not fun death imagery, like scenes from The Black Cauldron and Fantasia to a lesser extent, death as a major and clear narrative device started with Bambi. For those who've never seen Bambi, which we've talked about before, Bambi is probably best described in the commonly conceived saying, the Lion King without a plot, which is why it is personally such a hard pill for me to swallow. It had some of the best 2D animation of the Golden Age, but beyond Bambi's mother dying off screen, the events of the movie before and after are kind of like an anthology tied together with Bambi growing up. If Bambi's mother's death hadn't been so pronounced and unanticipated, toying with what the audience at the time expected to happen in the narrative, it's debatable at best how the film would be remembered without that scene. But allegedly it was Walt Disney's favorite during his lifetime, probably because it triggered a big emotional response from its audience. In the theatrical world, a big pioneer in death as a centralized theme is Don Bluth's work, doing a Mufasa-like death scene like Littlefoot and his mother in The Land Before Time, and using death as a main theme 
and all dogs go to heaven, where previously dead characters come back to Earth to finish off one last job. There is commonly a tied theme of death and mortality in animation. Charlie gets to go to heaven after he saves Anne-Marie, many villains throughout animation die due to the product of their own stupidity, instead of serving their time or becoming better patrons of society for the sake of a clean narrative. It says something about our values of a life worth living and what we want other characters in our story to be accountable for. The Lion King, yes, I know we talk about The Lion King a lot on this channel, bear with me, is probably the next biggest example of death used as a clear and serious narrative device in Disney, questioning the main character's motivations after the events take place. One of the reasons The Lion King is so progressive, and still really is, by the way, especially for Disney, this is a gritty and real representation of death with real consequences. Most Disney films that feature a princess has a death of their mother or parent as a minor life occurrence, something that happened off screen and presumably in their youth. It mostly just adds to the patriarchal relationship where they have to rule slash find a husband or whatever. So The Lion King is the first real Disney instance of tangible on-screen death with a big influence on the movie's main narrative. The Nightmare Before Christmas, which came out a year earlier, has a very different relationship with death as a major theme just because of the setting and how its universe works. We get a lot of death imagery, like a lot. The confusing aspect about Nightmare is that we don't really have a context and deep understanding of its characters before the events of the film. How did Halloween Town form? He was buried in that graveyard. Were Jack and some of the other humanoid citizens ever really people before all this? Can someone please tell me what a pumpkin king is? Another way to track their progress of Disney and other studios having a more lean hand in having characters talk and deal with death is their villain death. From the beginning, we've always had some not fun and painful deaths, but mostly off-screen implied. As we get further into the Disney canon though, we get some pretty gruesome ones. Eaten alive, dragged into hell, seeing the physical body hang there while you accidentally kill yourself. Ugh, whatever the f this is. I guess the thinking is this stuff is okay because it's the result of their actions and its moral consequences. Yay for karma. The biggest conversation about death and what it means to die comes from a likely source. Part of the Iron Giant's universal appeal is because it talks about death with a profound and mature weight by trying to explain it to a being that isn't human at all, by discussing the value that humans place on every life, human or animal. There's a finality and real gravity to that explanation, so much so that it convinces the giant to sacrifice himself for the sake of a concept that he might not even fully grasp. I really think the Iron Giant deserves to be remembered because of the sense of maturity and how it shapes films like this, and films after it. Much of its structure comes from director Brad Bird's own gripping with the sanctity of life due to losing his own sister to gun violence. Remember what I said? That honest depictions of death and general hardships can be good coping mechanisms for your audience. And maybe even you, Brad Bird, the director. As we advance to the early 2000s and beyond, animation as a medium has been much more honest depictions of death. Kickstarter's Coco, for instance, is consistent with themes of finding identity through deceased ancestors, and approaches the subject matter respectively while asking questions about what it means to live a life remembered. Disney's Moana plays with this theme also by having a previously unconventional character die and some light themes of reincarnation. There's also more adult programming, like Rick and Morty, which approaches death from all kinds of angles with heavy and real applications, like more traditional sci-fi despite being animated. Yeah, it's, it's like in Star Wars. Yeah, just like in Star Wars, go nuts. We still have instances where animation can not have an indirect approach where it comes to death as topic. Too bad it's Sunday, those buildings would have been filled up tomorrow. But for the most part, like in regular media, we're getting better at being realistic with what we show and what is natural to expect. Like any other hard issues, especially ones that tend to ask questions about the meaning of life and our existence in this universe, it's best to approach reading and writing them honestly. Hiding death in animation and really any medium aimed at children seems patronizing, and comes from an adult fear about death and the uncertainties of our existence. While this is something some closed-minded adults should probably seek therapy about, it isn't fair to water down big parts of our worldly understanding to others just because it's convenient. Death and our reason for existing can bring some positives like time management and artistic inspiration. Remember, we're all gonna die one day, so we might as well have a healthy media inclusive context, just like our literature and other parts of our artistic and everyday lives. And that's all folks, except it's not time for the ending gag. Fatality. 
everyone, thank you so much for watching. Click here to subscribe, we really appreciate it. Don't forget to turn your notifications on to get notified every time we make a new video. Click here to check out the main collaborator for the video, usually the editor. Click here to check out our video playlist for this video, where you'll find similar videos that you might just like, hopefully. There's also a credit scroll here where you can check out all the other awesome contributors. All their info is in the description. That's all I gotta say, KP away!